Okay. Okay, everyone. We are tonight. Uh, we are starting a new study on the fruit of the spirit, and I'm excited about the study. I've been thinking about it for some time now, uh, and. Uh, so we'll be here over a couple of months. Um, I probably will not be here for a few Wednesdays after tonight, but when I come back, which really, I guess this will be the, we need to th focus a lot tonight because if I'm not here for two weeks and the next week's a business meeting, uh, we'll, pick, we'll pick up mid-July uh, on the fruit of the spirit, I guess. But I'm excited about this study uh, together as we think about what it means for our life in Christ. Uh, but as we begin our study, I want to point out something because I'll forget later on. I'm going to be depending upon this book. Um, it's by an author named Christopher Wright, who is a scholar, pastor in England. Uh, does the name John Stott, is that familiar to anyone in the room? John Stott was a uh, British Christian in the 20th century, uh, kind of parallel with J.I. Packer in terms of his age and ministry. He was a lifelong single man who was an Anglican priest, but was dedicated to the Lord. He was a uh, he was a prolific preacher and author, and he also was passionate about the global church. And so he ran a ministry called the Langham Trust, whose job was kind of to uh, connect global Christians. He would bring global Christians to London to help train them. And anyway, John Stott has gone to be with the Lord. I think he passed away. Um, I'm gonna botch this pretty bad. I think he passed away maybe eight or nine, maybe even ten years ago now. But uh, the, his successor to, the, to directing that ministry in England is this guy named Christopher Wright. He's an Old Testament scholar, was a pastor, uh, and has written some amazing things. I have a commentary on Exodus that he just published in March that I'll be consulting soon in, the, in my bag over there. But he wrote this book on the Holy Spirit, and it's not, it's not highfalutin scholarly language. This, is, this guy is a great preacher and communicator. And so if, uh, if anyone is interested in kind of following along, I know right now, Amazon changes their prices every day, but right now this book is uh, less than $11 on Amazon. Uh, and uh, it would be a great thing as we to follow along. Also, if you go to the website, I've got the link here on the, uh, on, the, on the Bible study notes, but they have videos for all nine of the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, basically, their organization wanted to have an, an initiative to help British Christians grow in Christ-likeness. And so they it started this initiative called Nine a Day, and they it was based on a prayer of John Stott. If you actually will look at the back page of your Bible study notes, which mine are down here, look at the bottom of that page. Uh, this is a prayer that John Stott would pray every morning as he got out of bed. I kind of mentioned that daily rhythm of prayer, how it could help us. Well, this is something that he would pray daily. Uh, this is not the whole prayer, but it was a part of it. Uh, the Trinitarian prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that I may live this day in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He would pray this every day. And so they produce some really good videos. They're about 20 minutes a piece uh, that focus on these plus some other topics. Uh, but I think it would be a great thing if, you have, if you're able to kind of follow along with yourself uh, at home. Uh, I think it would be a great thing if you have the internet at home to just to supplement the study, I guess. Um, so as we start, before we hop in, though, we'll focus on the first fruit tonight, which is love. But before we do that, I want to talk about the why of the fruit of the Spirit. And one of the ways I want us to think about it is how do we measure our growth in Christ? How do we measure our growth in Christ? Uh, one way we can do that is by measuring numbers pretty easily, you know. So we can do that individually or as a church, you know. You can do the metrics. So for church, you can look at attendance and giving numbers. Uh, you can look at um, those things. But individually, you could use similar things. How, uh, how frequently have I attended church? How many days this past month did I read my Bible? How uh, much money have I given to the church? You can measure that. I don't think that's the most helpful thing. But and rather than measure the breadth of things, I think it's helpful to think about our depth and our relationship with the Lord. Are we growing close, closer to Christ? Are we becoming more spiritually mature? This is a process the Bible refers to as <coughs> sanctification. And that word... It just I call it part of the holy shins, you know, justification, sanctification, 
glorification, transformation, the holy shins, because they have the shin at the end of them. Uh, but what that word really means is that we are made holy. And there's kind of a one-time aspect of that, that when we're saved, God cleanses us from our sins. He calls us to be part of his holy people. But in addition to that, uh, this is the normal use of it, when we use it in common language, it refers to growing in the faith. Or, as I've put here, it's a process of spiritual growth by faith and the work of the Holy Spirit to be conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. It is the process of spiritual growth by faith and the work of the Holy Spirit to be conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Right? In the book of Galatians, which is where the fruit of the Spirit come from, uh, one line that Paul has uh, to use a metaphor that's a little bit too apt for me right now, he says, I'm anxious for you like a pregnant, laboring mother <laughs> until you are fully formed in Christ. I am anxious for you until you are fully formed in Christ. If you know anything about the letter to the Galatians, it's one of those letters that uh, Paul has uh, two or three letters this way, where he just starts off and he goes into the church. He's really upset about some things that have transpired. It's not just in one church. Galatia was a region, so it was kind of in a group of churches. But he's, and this is the thing he's anxious for, that they'll be formed until Christ is formed in you. And so here, here's just some things. If we break down my definition, first, it is a spiritual process, namely a work accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's an adjective I didn't put in the definition because it's kind of strange, but it's the, sup it's the process of spiritual growth by faith and the superintending work of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I mean by that is uh, that's a word that we use to refer to whenever we are working and doing what God is calling us to do. It's actually the Spirit working in and through us. It's, we're both working at the same time. And it's not that, you know, I'm a 50% partner and the Spirit's a 50% partner in this. I actually think it's all the Spirit, but as I'm obeying and living in the Spirit, I'm doing the Spirit's things. It's what Philippians 2, uh, 12 and 13 says, that God, uh, work out your own salvation for, with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. So as we are, in, you know my favorite passage of the Bible, right? I've, I've said it a lot of times, Philippians 2, 1 to 11, but you know, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient, even to the point of death, uh, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. Okay, so that's the, that's the great part. The very next verse, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. That's the, next, that's the next move that Paul takes. For it is God who wills and works to his good pleasure. It is God who works in you. So as we're working out our salvation, it's really God who's doing the work in us. So it's spiritual. We're dependent upon the Holy Spirit for this. The second is that it is a Christ-directed process. So whenever Jesus saves us, not only does he save us from our sin by the work that he did upon the cross, but we are saved to be made into his likeness. So we might use the term imitation. We want to be like Jesus. The what would Jesus do question is great for this. But this is the goal. Paul mentions this in Colossians chapter 3, that we are being formed into the image of Jesus Christ. Um, if we were to go back to the beginning of the Bible, we are made in the image of God, but uh, as a result of our <laughs> sin, that image is some people would use broken or fallen, something like that. But Jesus, he becomes in our image. He becomes the perfect human does everything that Adam was called to do but didn't, and now we are formed into, into the image of Jesus. So it's Christ-directed. We want to be more like Christ. We want to grow to be more like Christ. And also, I want us to note that it's gradual. It is a process. So God can do amazing things in ways that would amaze us and astound us, but typically spiritual growth is something that happens over weeks and months and years. It's, you know, it's not something that, well, I'm struggling with this sin, you know, let's kill this thing today. You know, well, that's awesome if you can do it. But typically, we're growing over the course of years. So, we're talking about sanctification. And one, another way we can measure our spiritual life, Jesus had a measurement. He said it in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew seven twenty. Thus you shall know them by their fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. And so, 
we look at the results, we look at the fruit, and that helps us discern false teaching, that helps us discern a person's character, their own maturity. But how do we produce fruit? Okay, so we want to produce fruit. How do we do that? Jesus also tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. So this is his last night with his disciples. Uh, in those final chapters, John 13 through 17. And he says to them, abide in me. He says, I am the true vine. And then he says, abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So as we live by faith, that's what abiding is. It's the constant, living, active faith in Jesus Christ. We will bear fruit. And he goes on to say, you know, those branches that don't produce fruit, we're going to cut them off. We're going to put them in the, wood, you know, the brush pile and we'll burn them. But those who are in Christ will bear fruit. Uh, so we abide in him by faith. And again, it's this life in Christ that makes all the difference. So Paul, again, he speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. We mentioned him earlier. We'll mention him again in a moment. But thus far in the letter, uh, Paul's concerned. If you know, if you read the book of Galatians, the kind of main thing is that there are these Jewish Christians who are insisting that Gentile converts to Christianity also adapt these Jewish norms. It almost be like uh, saying, you know, look at us. We're all wearing blue jeans tonight. Uh, that's what you do as an American. You know, we have a few exceptions. That's okay. But uh, in order to be a Christian, you know, you've got to wear the you got to wear the clothing, right? You need to put on blue jeans like us, wear the right clothes. It was a bit more strict than that because they were actually thinking they were following God's law. You know, uh, we take a rest on the Sabbath. We don't eat uh, non-kosher food. We, uh, you know, we. Again, for the, for the males, we circumcise our males. So if you're going to be a, become a Christian, first you've got to become a Jew, and then you can become a Christian. And Paul says, no, you're erecting another structure on someone who's been freed from the law. There's that famous line in Galatians 2, 14 and 15. Uh, we're justified by, by grace through faith alone, not by works of the law. So he wants to free them. There's the, on the one hand, you've got law enforcers who are wanting everyone to follow their prescriptive path for Christianity. You've got to do it exactly the way I'm doing it. If you do it any other way, you're wrong. And then you've also got, on the other hand, people he's concerned about, rule rejectors. These are people who think, well, I'm free in Christ. I don't have to worry about morality anymore. Right? The, the law has been abolished. I'm free from that. And Paul is wanting to push back against both of those extremes. He says in Galatians 2.20, this very famous verse, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer, I want you to pay attention to the words. I've been crucified with Christ, doesn't mean he dies. It is no longer I who live, but who? Christ who lives within me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, the Christian life that we have united to Christ is actually animated by life in the Spirit. That's another phrase that Paul will use later on. And so in chapter 5, he keeps on going on this roll of things. We need to keep in step with the Spirit. If we walk with the Spirit, let us also live by the Spirit. And I think when he says live there, I don't think he's talking about just our way of life. I think he's really talking about our our animated life, the, the life that we continue, if we've been crucified with Christ, we've been buried with him in baptism and death, that's Romans 6 language. We've been raised to walk in the newness of life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we live by the Spirit now. And one of the battles that Paul is aware that all Christians wage is the war against the flesh. Every human has things in their life they struggle with. Um, it's not something that's unique to Christians. People will have addictions. They will have things and bad habits they want to break. They will have relationships they want to cut off. That's not unique to Christians. Right? I'm doing something. There's something wrong that I want to do that I don't want to do. But what's unique about Christians is that we understand this to be a war of our flesh against the desires of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so, again, part of growth and holiness and sanctification is not simply that we sin less. That's a, that's a, that's a good thing. But it also is more than that. It results in good fruit. Uh, love, for example, is not simply you know not committing sin. We'll talk about love as 
doing things. It's it's an active thing. It's it's a warmth and a care and a relational thing with other people. So as we start thinking about the fruit of the Spirit, I want us to just understand that it is a spiritual process. Paul in Galatians 19 and 21, I'm not going to read the whole list now, but he lists this, in this longer um, list of sins, the works of the flesh. Uh, and they're all things that are contrary to the Lord, but we as Christians have the fruit of the Spirit. And that's where I want us to go tonight. Uh, I probably will read a little bit more because I didn't read at the beginning of our our study tonight. So if you have your Bible, feel free to turn to Galatians 5. I want to read a little bit of context to train the fruit of the Spirit that we read about. So I'm going to read Galatians 5, uh, 16 through 24. Actually, 7, 7 through 24. Paul says, no, nah, I'm going to go back to it. We gotta read the whole chapter, guys. That's just the way it has to be. Okay, <laughs> chapter one. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, notice the Spirit language as I read through this. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly ourselves await the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Strong language. But you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch that you do not or you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you will not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. He lists a bunch of sins. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip them now. Uh, it says at the end of verse 21, I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So notice that if we live, if we have life by the Spirit, then we need to keep in step. We need to walk along with the Holy Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The first spirit that Paul talks about is love. And this is probably not surprising to us at all. Uh, again, I think the person who is so consumed with Jesus Christ, the person who is living a spiritual life, aware of the Holy Spirit, uh, they will be consumed by and defined by love. I also think that the absence of one life of love in somebody's life is an indication that they're not bearing the fruit that God would have them to bear. Jesus affirms that love is the greatest commandment. We know that, you know, uh, teacher, the lawyer, Matthew twenty two twenty seven. you know, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? You know what the law says, the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then listen to what he says after that. Upon these two commands stands the entire law and the prophets. You know the, you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy and all the words said in the prophets, those two things are built upon this, these two commands, essential commands, to love God and to love neighbor. And then if we look back at what we said in Galatians already, what Paul said in verse 6, right, not circumcision or certain uncircumcision counts for they don't count for anything but what counts only faith which works through love verse 13 and 14 
You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You heard what Jesus said about that. And again, love is, I think it's the first fruit because it's the fruit without which the other stuff doesn't matter. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. And if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. If I make all kinds of great sounds, if I do amazing things, if my faith is so strong that I move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. So Paul himself is, he's very consistent upon this point. We think about the book of James chapter 2. He's talking about the need for us as Christians to do good works. You can tell he's very anxious about people receiving a gospel of justification by faith, but then they use that as a reason to either do works of the flesh, you know, to live in sin, or to, and again, they've got their heavenly fire insurance, so I don't need to worry about life. And James says, listen, everybody. The demons believe in Jesus, and they tremble, but they're still going under judgment. They believe, they understand that he exists, but... Uh, faith without works is dead. So it's it's almost like this. Faith comes before works and love, but the absence of love and works indicates an absence of faith. So it's not as if they're two things, but they're two commands bundled, packaged together. And so love is a, I think love is our first fruits. This is like, should be our hallmark. As Christians and our, our love is directed towards three groups of people the first is not really a group of people I guess you could say it's a group of persons but it's one the one God right our life is defined by loving God uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 63 verse 3 that your steadfast love your loving kindness is greater than life uh, we receive the love of God and we return that love to him think of first John chapter 4 verses 7 and 8 uh, beloved let us love one another for love is of God, and God is love. God is love. I think this is his first and foremost attribute. So, and, and this is what consumes our Christian life in the present. It's what we look forward to in the future, that we would know and love Jesus more and more. I heard someone pray that this past week who was dealing with illness. And they said, God, I don't know what the future holds for me, but I pray that you would help me to know Jesus and to love Jesus more, because that's what I need more than anything else. So we have the fruit of love for God. The second is love for one another. We've spoken a lot about this. You know, we studied 1 John earlier this year. And 1 John is all about, it's, I think it's a little brief book letter about love. But Jesus himself said in John 13, he says that there's three times or, uh, in the Gospel of John that you love one another. Uh, I, I give you a new command, but it's not a new command that I give to you, but I'm, just, I'm still giving it to you, that you love one another. And then he even would say that the world will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. So uh, the love that we have, it's not that we want to selfishly love one another and not love other people, but if we aren't loving one another, how can we love other people well? I think it's in, uh, John would, would, will go on to say, if you can't love the person in front of you who you can see, how can you love God whom you cannot see? And then we love the world. And this is, again, this is loving our neighbor. That might be a better phrase for it. Uh, it's a countercultural love. Uh, just as, remember I quoted Philippians 2 earlier to you, just as Jesus stepped into our situation to love us, we also go and to love those, we step into other people's situations to love them. Uh, love, uh, we've used the term apologetic before. Love is the greatest apologetic. That means love is the greatest defense for the faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and I think that the world will be one to Christ as they witness our love. So as you think about love this week, as we kind of part ways, again, as we noticed, we'll probably be a three-week hiatus on the fruit of the Spirit. But I want you to think about love. It's the greatest one, so there's plenty to meditate upon it. Maybe if you have time, we can watch that video together that I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson. But you know, what short stories in the Bible... If you think about, you know, as you read the Bible, what are some stories in the Bible that demonstrate examples of love for other people? Also, I want you to think about why, again, why is it important that love is the first fruit? Why love is the first fruit? And how we can love one another better. Uh, yeah, the world will know we are his, his disciples by our love for one another. 
So that's that's the end of the study tonight. Uh, let me say a word of prayer from, from past time, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the chance to study your word tonight with my brothers and sisters. As we heard your word in Galatians, that uh, God, that the only thing that matters in our life is that if we have faith working through love, we can look at the list of commands that you give us in the Old Testament. We could look at the Sermon on the Mount and other list of exhortations in the New Testament. But ultimately, what rests at the heart of our Christian life is faith, trusting Jesus Christ. And it's a faith that is not just centered on us, but rather it moves outward. It's a faith that is connected to love. And so by love, we uh, care for each other. We put away the works of the flesh, which would be unloving actions. And instead, we seek to how we can give of ourselves so that we can reach and love others. God, ultimately, that we can manifest your presence in your works in our midst. So would you be with us, Father? Would you help us to be a loving people? And would you help us to bear fruit, uh, to bear the fruit of love? God, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.